Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the sixth and final session for the 2011 in our Water and Growth Speaker Series. Over the past several months, Council has been hosting a number of forums to discuss water and growth in our community. Tonight's presentation will be approximately one hour with a question period to follow. Just a quick aside, we have a prize table set up. Please enter your names for the draws. That's just outside. We always have some great draws. And not only that, we have coffee and cookies and water. Good Okotoks have core water out there. So by all means, uh, go get something, even perhaps during your presentation. If you need something, go right ahead. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, David Baxter, a demographer, economist, and senior advisor with the Urban Futures Institute. Mr. Baxter will be managing change in the Calgary region and how it may affect Okotoks and area. Mr. Baxter's presentation will focus on population and economic change and the resulting implications for business and society. He will address such timely issues as understanding changing markets, ch changing consumer markets, the shifting nature of work and the process of urban and metropolitan change. In particular, you're going to hear about a Joel uh, Joel Cohen, who talked about how many people can the earth, the earth support, a, a book and so on. I went on today and looked up that book. One of the quotes in this book is from uh, somebody in the world, but this quote basically says that uh, he, this gentleman knows of some lads, some farm lads in the world who are in jail, nine years old, they're in jail now, for murder over water disputes. So water is certainly a crucial issue in the world, by all means. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's welcome Mr. David Baxter. Disputes in our water are usually about somebody taking a shower that's too long before me. Good evening, everybody. Um, I was born in Edmonton. I grew up in Red Deer. My first visit to Calgary was in 1946 to see my grandmother who lived at the top of the hill where the bridge with the lions on it is. Because that's how I think of, of Calgary. I've been in this region. I um, used to work uh, with a, a hauling company. So I uh, know Bragg Creek and Longview and Black Diamond. So beautiful country. I brought a friend from Egypt here once. I had to do some work in... Uh, Lethbridge and the person from Egypt was coming to Canada to visit and uh, so they somehow we met in Calgary at 5 o'clock in the morning on the 21st of June and we drove down to Medicine Hat and the person still talks about it I mean first of all because it's the, the brightest they've ever seen 5 o'clock in their life but the mountains and all the rest so I really like this this part of Alberta I, uh, I come here every year I've been here through good times and bad times, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me again. So, I'm a geek. I live for numbers. I have very few social skills. <laughs> my, spouse and, my spouse and my children will tell you that. Um, and so what I do in my life is deal with the issue of how many. How many, many things. I've just finished... Uh, uh, a paper that will be published in the Spinal Cord Research Journal on the prevalence of spinal cord injury in Australia. I've done work on uh, how many people are going to need organ transplants in Canada over the next 20 years. I know nothing about those subjects. Mine's the how many part. So what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is exactly the same thing, the how many, but I'm going to talk about how many people. So I'm working from a mathematical perspective, I'm a, a systems level programmer, I write code and that kind of stuff, to build population models. I build them for people, I build them for fisheries, uh, anything that basically are born, move around and die. So I'm going to talk tonight about how many people, I'm going to talk about how many people in the Calgary region. I'm not going to specify how many people in Okotoks, I'm not going to talk about that because that's really a choice that your community makes. It's not a statistical choice, it's a planning, land use, transportation, water issue. So I'm going to, if you like, talk about the context for the discussions you're going to have. And what I hope to do is, is provide you with a, I'm actually going to provide you with 155 slides worth of data 
most of which interest me deeply, but again, we know my problems. But you will find things in some of them or all of them that you might find useful to consider in your discussions about the future of your community. How many people came from Cohen's book, How Many People Can the World Support? It's fascinating to read. It's got lots of great stuff in it. But it has a really interesting, the book has a really interesting relationship with the title because he doesn't answer it. What he says instead is that much remains to be learned about natural constraints and natural constraints cannot be viewed by other than through the lens of human activity. So what he's saying to us is how many people really depend on how we choose to live. And so the issue very quickly stops being the mathematical issue of how many people, the issue that addresses me, and instead addresses the community issue of how people to choose to live in a community. So it's an interesting discussion because what deeply fascinates me is the number. And in many senses, the number is irrelevant. What is relevant is how those people choose to live and do live. That has implications whether we're looking at the, the theme of your series, which is how people use water, or people, how people use land, or how people use buildings. So the focus then in my discussion is always going to be to look at this balance between how many and how they choose to live. That is to me a really empowering, optimistic statement. Because if how many depends on how we live, we can do things about how we live. Pretty hard for us to do something about how many people there are in the world. Seven billion on October 31st. Um, and all of them are on the Lionsgate Bridge when I want to go home. Um, so the issue is we can't do much about that. Those are things, but what we can do is do things about how people live. So it's a very positive statement uh, coming from his, his work. These images are from the Calgary Regional Partnership website. I always say that because I'm, they're copyrighted and I don't want any representatives from the CRP to get upset about me using them. So I'm going to use them as my themes going through. But how many people in this context is I'm going to talk about trend-based projections of population in the Calgary region. So that's my topic for tonight. Um, deep numbers uh, about 65 years in the future. Um, oh, okay. In that, because there is a process now going on of regional planning uh, for the region or, or the regional strategy for the Calgary Regional Partnership, municipalities and towns and cities are constantly going through revising their plans. It's important to understand that the numbers that we as technicians produce are inputs to planning, they're not plans themselves. So that when we say uh, there's gonna be this many people in the region in this year, it's unequivalent of saying that a bus will hold 60 people or a sewer pipe will hold this much water. It's a number that goes into the planning process. The output of a planning process is better ways of doing things. That's what we're looking for when we, we plan. We're not looking for technology or a technical solution. We're looking for a human solution. And it allows us to focus our energies not on what we can't change, but on what we can change. So that's the context for my work. What's this region I'm talking about, the Calgary region? Uh, everybody has their own definition of the Calgary region. What we did in 2007 when we looked at the Calgary region is look at a region structured around um, Highway 2 and the Trans-Canada Highway and the major roads leading into that highway. So we're not looking at a Calgary-centered region or the Calgary sphere of influence. We're really just looking at people who in this part of Alberta share either in the major or minor road system as sort of from a transportation perspective. Many of those people's activities will never involve the city of Calgary. That area it extends from Banff to Husser, Oles to below Nanton, includes all the areas, towns, cities, villages, First Nations lands, um, municipal, re municipal, regional municipalities, is that what they're called? Municipal districts. Municipal, yeah. Municipal. Um, so Vulcan County, Knee Hill, Bighorn, Foothills, all included. 
That's a pretty big area. It had, in 2011, a population of 1.4 million people. Um, from a statistical perspective, there's another area that, that's a standard data area called Census Division 6. It's been around since, I think, 1921 or 1931, defined by Statistics Canada. And it has absolutely no logical basis for having it. It's just something that way back when they divided the province up into at that time, I think it was 18 areas, and they've collected data for that geography ever since. So it's interesting. Um, it is useful to use it because the provincial government publishes data at that level. So that's about 96, it's all contained within our region. It's about 96% of the population. And then there's a metropolitan region that Statistics Canada defines, which is the city of Calgary, uh, Rocky View County, the towns and villages within that sphere, as well as the First Nations land, and it's about 90% of the population. So I'm going to be addressing this larger geography uh, most of the time, but occasionally I will go to these two geographies. It's simply to, to get data that's been published that isn't available for our transportation geography. There's the population of this region, um, Mid-year of 2011, about 1.4 million people. It almost but not quite doubled over the last 25 years from about uh, 760,000 people to 1.4. And so that's our starting point when we talk about the future. Now I'm forecasting 65 years in the future. Can anybody really forecast 65 years in the future? No. But the purpose of forecasting 65 years in the future is not to be right about 65 years in the future, but rather to see what the logical consequences are of the things we know today. So I've got 65 years of data about this region. I've been in this region for 65 years. So that I can take a look at that data and say, what are the consequences of what's in this data? What are the consequences if these trends carry on into the future? Now, there's going to be good times, there's going to be bad times. How many people were here in 92, 82? The 20% interest rate times. The province was losing population at that period of time. Rolled into the boom of the late 80s and into the, the slowdown and again, loss of population in the early 90s and then back up into the boom. So in our future, our future is a, a representation of all of those trends. So we go out, in this case, 65 years, from a technical point of view, what we're concerned is in the near term, the next five or so years, 10 years, we're really forecasting for people to deal with things that are operational, number of buses, uh, number of employees, that kind of stuff. We go out a, a little further, it's more the time frame for capital investment. New hospitals, uh, new road networks, new transit systems, that kind of thing. And we go out further up to after 2050, and we're really talking about st strategic planning issues. So we're not talking about hardware. We're talking about things like um, reserving right of ways and preserving uh, natural space and that kind of strategic issue of putting in place today the basis for future decisions. And that's really what we're looking at. So that from a planning perspective, there's really nothing today that we're actually going to make a a, 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 an expenditure decision, if you like, today that relies on us being precise out here in um, 2076. But what we want to know is what's the scale. So we don't want to be predicting that the Flames are going to win the Stanley Cup in 76, but we actually want to know if there's going to be ice to play hockey on. So that's the nature of this kind of forecasting. People will, by the way, we have enormous precision. We can get 85 decimal points in these numbers. But it's just because we have to. That's what the computer require us to do. Um, and we will be wrong every time. But on average, we'll be right. Sometimes we'll be slow. Some, there's a book out you might be interested in called Black Swans. And there's a, a critique of the work, such as the work I do, forecasting work, because we don't forecast the black swan. We don't, most swans are white, but some are black. And while it's a great book to read, he kind of misses the point, which is the nature of the work I do relies on large numbers, the theory of large numbers. And so we can't forecast the individual because what we're doing is forecasting the large numbers. So I have a pretty good, I could be probably within half a percent of the number of boys that will be born in Calgary 
this year. But I can't tell you who their moms are going to be specifically. So that's the nature of this long-term forecasting. Now on that though, if my forecasts are wrong in 2076, I'll redo them. <laughs> so that's one framework, but there's another framework for doing this that perhaps makes it a little bit more understandable of why we forecast so far in the future. And that is if I do a 65 year forecast, I'm talking about the rest of the life of somebody graduating from high school today. And in a generational sense, in a sustainability sense, that's what I should be talking about. I should be talking about the life of the next generation. In fact, I should be doing 85 year forecasts, the life expectancy of a child born in the region today. So that makes a pretty compelling case for longer term forecasting to see where we're going to see if there's gonna be an ice rink for that kid to play hockey on, not whether they'll be drafted for the NHL or not. Um, Another context to look at the growth in this region is, is that it's pretty robust. It grows at about twice the rate of Canada's rate, generally in the range of 2% to 3% a year, but it's extremely volatile. And if we actually ran this back out here to September 21st, 1981, we'd see that it can get really scary and really negative. 20% uh, interest rates, Abacus cities went broke. Uh, people were shoving the keys for their houses through bank doors so that they didn't have to make mortgage payments. People flooding, the, and now it turns around and people are coming back knocking on the door of the bank saying, hey, can you lend me $500,000 to buy a place? So there's the gross rate thing, very volatile, but generally twice the Canadian rate and in the range of two to 3%. I'm starting with the conclusion and we'll walk through how I got there during the rest of this evening. But if we take historical trends, trends in, in Canada, all of these issues, regions trend population growth will be to hit out about 2036 to hit 2.2 million, out to 2061 to hit 2.8 million, and by 2076 to be about 3 million people. Oh, it's a lot of people, isn't it? But that's where history, trends in Canada, trends in this region, birth rates, death rates, life expectancy, that's where they'll take you. It's not saying you're gonna go there, but it's saying that's where trends are gonna take you. And it's gonna be pretty hard to find something that, the best way to change these trends, have a huge, huge recession where everybody's unemployed and leaving the province. So that's the con, there, so there's my projections. That's what, in a regional sense, you're likely to have to work with. It doesn't mean much to you, because it's just a number. What it does do then is say, okay, how are we going to have to live in the context of this order of magnitude growth? Now, that looks like a big number. It's almost doubling again over the next 25 years, and then almost doubling again, not almost doubling, picking up another 800,000 over the rest of the period. But to take that big number and tell you why it's likely to be the number you're gonna see is if we take a look at the growth rate that that implies, that implies that the growth in this region slows from the range of two to 3% per year, slows that by 2076 it's growing at less than half a percent a year. It's growing slower than it has ever grown except during the worst possible years in its history. So when you're looking at that, that's, the three million may be a big number, that's growing pretty slowly compared to how it has grown on a percentage basis. So we'll see this evening why this projection for slowing growth, but that's another reason to say, you know, this is, this is a pretty likely scenario given what we know now. There may be something so dramatic and so unknown that this changes radically, but given what we know now, this is the number that we're working with. Always a good idea in the forecasting business to see what other people say. Just, you know, because if they're way off, you want to know why they're wrong. Um, so we, uh, first of all, went back. This is work we were just doing this fall. We went back and we did a projection back in 2007, and it had a population in 2076 of under 3 million, of 2.69, 2.969 million people. Why are we higher now than we were four years ago? Well, there's four years more data and that 
growth in the past four years has been a little bit higher. But sports fans, there's no difference between those two numbers. 2.969 and 3.03, the same number. So let's see what the other guys say. So we go and we see the only people forecasting that a region anywhere that approximates the region that we're talking about is the Alberta Ministry of Finance, who does a set of projections at the census division level. Uh, so CD6, so it's about 96%. But because the census division is included in our region and is 96% of it, it's pretty likely they'll grow at about the same rate. So we take the rate of growth that the Ministry of Finance projects for CD6 and apply it to um, our base population and our computer leaps out. They only go to 2050. And they say in 2050, using that growth rate, there'll be 2.5 million people here in 2050. We originally said there'd be 2.476, and now we're saying 2.560. Who cares? Um, it's 2.5 million people in 2050. So the issue with that is we can now stop talking about the number. What we have to do is talk about the implications of that number. So one of the things is there's nothing I like better than arguing with other forecasters. But remember, none of us has social skills. You know, so we enjoy doing this, and we phone each other. How can you say that? How can you possibly be 10,000 higher than us? Of course, they're probably 10,000 higher in the base year as well, but we never talk about that. So the, the, the bottom of this is that if you take a look at what trend-based forecasts are, what people are saying, given reasonable probability of what we know from the past and what's happening in the world today, this is the number. So what we should do is say, okay, and move on and just work with that set of numbers for strategic planning purposes. We do forecasts every year because we get new data, not only about the current periods, but we get revisions for historical periods. Births are always underreported, uh, deaths are always re underreported historically because it can take for up to two years for a death certificate to wind up in vital statistics. So we're always going back and revising deaths up and births up and immigration and temporary, all that kind of stuff. So it's a good idea to do it, but the numbers aren't going to change unless there is some huge... I've ever said, you know, we're not, not going to be able to attract skilled immigrants to Alberta anymore. I just spent five weeks in Italy. Every young, skilled Italian person is going, where do we get those big white hats for Calgary? So there's a huge pool of people. Every, every entrepreneurial Greek kid wants to be in Okotoks because there is no future in the community he's in or she's in. So let's work with those numbers that we're talking about. Uh, 1.5 million in 2013, 2030, let's say 2 million, 2050, 2.5 million, and somewhere between 2071 and 2079, 3 million people in the region. So there's the how many, and I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening. <laughs> Because really, that's not an interest. You don't care. Nobody cares about how many. What you'd like to know is who. Because that's really what's going to define your community is who's here, not how many are here. So let's now, even though it's not on our outline for this evening, let's take a look at the more interesting question of who. Who are these people? Why are they coming here? What's going on? And more importantly, what are the, how does that shape the big picture, how does the answer to who, in fact, influence the how many? So there's the age, pro this is just, this is my favorite chart. I just love this chart. Um, it's the age profile for Canada's population. Uh, males, females, single years of age up to 100. And you can see on it the infamous baby boom cohort, that bulge between the ages of 45 and 65 that has 9.8 million people. Uh, just under 30% of the Canadian population. There are more people aged 45 to 64 than there are people aged 25 to 44. More people up there than there are here, and there's more in both of those than there's people under the age of 20. Put another way, right now in Canada, there is between the ages of 45 and 64, 9.8 million people. Between the ages of 0 and 19, there's 7.8 million people. 
as the 45 to 54 year olds retire, out of our current population, there is a two million person shortfall in terms of the working age population. That statement shapes almost all of federal government policy because they're looking at a situation where they're talking about the population aged 65 to 84, 65 to 74, 65 to 74, dramatically increasing as that bulge shifts up, at the same time out of our domestic population, the base shrinking, and they're asking the question, how do we pay for it? So there's the demographic challenge that's going to, well, not directly related to this region, is going to be shaping how everybody thinks about policy, about how we're gonna pay for pensions, how we're gonna pay for healthcare, all of these issues come out of that driver. There's the picture for Canada. There's the picture for this region. Whoa, typical Canadian is 40, typical Canadian, Stephen Harper, Katie Lang. <laughs> Do that visually in your mind, just for a minute. No. Both born in 1959, 1961, peak of the baby boom. Typical Canadian then, 49 years old. Typical person in this region, 29 years old. With an expanding number of young people. Wow. There must be something in that Epcor water, eh? <laughs> it was Epcor water, wasn't it? Is that what you called it? Yeah, Epcor water. Epcor water, yeah, okay. Um, why do you have such a younger population? Now, let's take a look at the first obvious thing is we should look at your birth rates because young people actually, that's where young people actually come from births. <laughs> Mom told me that. No, she told me that last week, but nonetheless she told me that. Mom's 95 and lives in Hinton and is a scary person. Um, she every, every week writes a letter to Preston Manning. <laughs> well, you know, she's old, she hasn't made the shift. It'll come, it'll come. Um, so we look at birth rates, and this is the total fertility rate, the average number of, woman, uh, number of children a woman would bear in her lifetime at prevailing birth rates. And we can see that in the peak of the baby boom, typical woman would have had four children during her lifetime. And today, a typical woman in Canada would have 1.68 children during her lifetime. Put that in context, it, we have the replacement level, which is 2.1 children per woman. Peak of the baby boom, a woman replaced herself, her spouse, and added two kids to the population. Today, a woman replaces herself, she replaces two-thirds of a man, and if you do not think that's true, ask a woman, <laughs> okay? And adds no young people to the population. So below the replacement level birth rate. And we have been at the below the replacement level birth rate since 1971. The consequence of the introduction of multi-channel television. <laughs> okay, so very uh, below the replacement level birth rate, 1.6. That's what for the last 40 years, this big bulge, this high level of births here created that bulge, age 45 to 54. And this very low level of birth since that created that narrower population at the base. So we look at that and we say, well, there's Canada's picture, but Alberta's different. It's got a, you know, like a higher birth rate. Yeah, but not noticeably so. Its birth rate is certainly a bit above the Canadian birth rate, but not significantly. Back here in 2004, 2005, it looked like it was breaking away and taking off, and, and four point, you're saying, you know, 4% unemployment rate, how do they find time? Well, the way they find time is they manage to do it between shifts or something, because the instant the economy slows down, Alberta's birth rate dropped right back to the Canadian average. And where does Calgary sit in all of this? Right in the middle. So you don't have more young people in your population because of the water. If you, all other things equal, you would have exactly the same age profile as Canada would have. So you're, you have got that bulge in your younger population because of migration. And so we take a look at this. These are the migrants. You have a disproportionate share of migrants that, that brings out this age profile. And because you have so many of these, you have so many kids. 
So what gives you the usefulness of your population is migration and many sources of migration, interprovincial in-migration, uh, intraprovincial, Immigration, and then you lose people through emigration. The Americans need a few good hockey players, just to make the NHL more robust. Uh, intraprovincial out, interprovincial out. Now, interestingly enough, intraprovincial, a movement between this region and other parts of the province, it's almost a wash. There's about 500 people on average a year difference. People come, they go, kids flowing back and forth. Historically, the big difference has been um, that. In inter people coming from the rest of Canada, interprovincial in, exceeded interprovincial out, but they're both incredibly volatile. Right now, historically, Alberta is a net source of migrants for British Columbia. Right now, it's reversed and it's a net destination for British Columbia. That will change. It bounces back and forth. Same with migration to Saskatchewan. You have a big, big jump in interprovincial migration one year. In migration, you have a big out migration the next year. Immigration is offset by emigration, but over the last five, six years, Immigration has moved up a, uh, a higher level, if you like, of immigration, and is higher than it has been historically. If we put all of those, oh, before we look at that, but notice if you kind of, this is, this is what, when I go home and show my grandkids the charts at night, um, you'll notice that for interprovincial in, intraprovincial in, intraprovincial out and interprovincial out, well, there's a lot of volatility. On average, they're relatively constant. It's like in engineering, you talk about cuts and fills. By the time we do cuts and fills over the last 20, 25 years, pretty stable intra and interprovincial ins and outs. Emigration, pretty stable. Immigration, pretty stable, except over that last five-year period. So there you are, pretty stable. Now just think about it, if that's been pretty stable numerically in the past, and it's going to, and I, I'm going to argue it's going to be pretty stable in the future, that's why you get a slowing in your growth rate, because you have about the same number of people coming in and going out, but your population base is growing, so it's the same number on a bigger base, so the growth rate drops down. Um, so there's the picture, just the historical picture there. And if we net it all out and say, what is total net migration, everything, work permits, non-permanent residents, all of that stuff, roll it all together. There's the bad years. There's the good years. There's a slowdown. It's already reversed again. There's your net migration component. And again, it's been, in terms of cuts and fills, it's pretty, pretty stable. Um, so there's where your migration, why migration is important, is the typical person moving to this region from the rest of the province is 24, from the rest of the country is 23, 24, immigrants, 26. Why migration is so important is it's something that young people do. And so it brings those young people to your population and takes them away from the rest of Canada. And so one of the issues you have is when you go to forecast in the future, you always have to say, where is Alberta going to get the young people from? It's always the question. Because you say, well, they just keep coming from the Maritimes. The Maritimes will run out. <laughs> but more importantly, as their unemployment rates fall, it becomes a more attractive place to stay. So there's that, that market compensation that means, you don't know, there, there are newfies who aren't coming, boy. You know, they're there. Uh, and so the, the issue becomes always the challenge that Alberta is going to face with its economy is where is it going to get the workers from? You have to answer that question in a forecasting context. Um, so if having had that discussion, then in order to do our forecast for Calgary, we have to do a forecast for Canada. It's not just because I like the charts. Okay, we have to, I'm compelled to do that. So if we take a look at um, birth rates and that issue of the replacement level, we can see that when re birth rates are above the replacement level, where it's absolutely correct that your population grows, but also grows younger because for every two adults, you get kids. When you drop below the replacement level, not only are you not, there's two adults, but how many, well, how many kids are added to the population? 1.6. So along with the below the replacement level birth rate goes not only a declining population, but an aging population.
Um, any of you, by the way, just for completely irrelevant, but any of you who follow uh, world GDP data, <laughs> well, I do, everybody slags Japan and says, oh, what a terrible, look at the poor economic performance in Japan. Their labor force has been declining since 1995. Take a look at their GDP per worker, it's pretty good. Okay. But if you have a declining population, you can't compare it to a country with a growing... Anyway, totally irrelevant. Um, so there's the, what shapes Canada's policy, what shaped that age profile. If you take that age profile and just flip it over, it almost perfectly matches that birth rate chart. So Canada looks at this, and then, here we go. And the bank, uh, the former uh, chair of the uh, governor of Bank of Canada looks at this chart and he says, this aging is no longer an abstract issue for policymakers, cautioning that Canada needs a productivity miracle to avoid a demographic torpedo to the economy. When an economist uses the word miracle, <laughs> be very concerned, my friends, be very concerned because Miracles don't happen very often in economics. It's the dismal science. Um, so what he is concerned about, what the, 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 the issue is the aging of the population, yes, many more older people, but also the shrinking of the younger population. So let's take, just to consider, right now, uh, 2010, uh, the 34 million people in Canada at trend mortality rates of that 34 million people, 80% will be alive in 20 years. And they'll be 20 years older. I went to the U of A, so I can do that in my head. <laughs> um, so the issue is that everybody's around, most of us who are around will continue to be around, will be older, and that older has some implications. We add on to it, the number of births that would occur to this population, so no migration in and out of Canada. And do you realize, we don't need migration to keep our population constant. Our population will remain constant without migration. What it won't do is stop aging. And so if we take a look at this age profile, and this is something you can do in the privacy of your own home. You take the age profile of Canada and today's mortality rates and today's birth rates, it's all you need, they're just numbers, they're all up on websites and you run that forward, and you say, what will happen to the population of Canada with trend births and death rates and no migration? This is not a forecast, this is pure math. This has to happen. What you see is all of our growth is in the over 65 population, because there's relatively few people over the age of 65 now, and look out, because the baby boom cohort's coming, and there are few people after the baby boom cohort so the bottom of the age profile shrinks, and interestingly enough, even if the birth rates went up significantly in the next 20 years, it wouldn't do any good because over the next 20 years, those kids wouldn't have hit the labor force because you don't give birth to five-year-olds. <laughs> I told you the U of A heritage, it sticks, it sticks. So the issue is this is, this without migration, this is the picture. It's neither good nor bad. It's just a picture, but it's a picture we have to deal with because we're talking about 4.3 million, remember the 9.8 million baby boomers today. Well, in 20 years, they're going to add 4.3 million people to the top of the age profile, and the below 65 age will have um, <clears throat> 2.5 million fewer people. We have a problem. How we solve it is up to us. Denial is not, will not lead us to a solution. But it's fun to do for a while. Um, so about 18% uh, decline in the population under the age of uh, 65 and a doubling of the population over the age of 65. And why we care about that is that healthcare costs go above average, per capita healthcare costs go above average uh, at age 60 and they double per capita every decade you get older. So we're going to have some health care expenditures. And we have an 80% pay-as-you-go pension plan where all of the people who are beneficiaries are over the age of 60 and all of the people who are contributors are under the age of 65. Now, we can tweak stuff at the margin 
but it's at the margin. There's the big picture. So we have to do some stuff for it to, with respect to this. What the economists are concerned with is at a time when we need a robust economy to pay the bills, its growth is going to be constrained by a shrinking labor force. That's the net, the, the net of the discussion. Um, and so what the, the, the discussion is, is what we first of all need is to have economic growth. By the way, if you don't have economic growth, don't discuss this stuff because you can't solve it. They, the worst, th how would you like to be mayor of Detroit? You have absolutely nothing to do any. He would love to have some growth because it could do something for him. So we have promote economic growth. Now, everybody who's saying, if I hear it one more time, I'll kill myself. No, I won't. I'll scream uh, and have a Ryan 7. Um, the aging of the baby boom will crush the healthcare system. Absolutely wrong. Absolutely, absolutely wrong. If we hold health spending per capita by, for each age group exactly as it has today, in other words, if we preserve today's healthcare system exactly as it is, which means, by the way, that its real costs remain as it is today per capita, so no one, no, nothing beyond inflation, if you like, and our economy grows at 2.5% per year, we can fund healthcare exactly as it is today, no changes. But we must have the 2.5% economic growth. It is no way inevitable that the health baby boomers will crush the healthcare system. Only if per capita age-specific costs increase faster than inflation, which they have for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. Will we have a problem? So it's, the system's absolutely sustainable. So you, don't, you don't need to be frightened. But we've got to have the 2.5% economic growth. For the health minister's meeting last week in the Maritimes, the provincial ministers asked for 6% growth and the Fed, per year for 10 years, and the federal minister came back and said, two, which is pretty well what we expect the economy to grow at. So that's what it's tied to. So promote economic growth, first of all. Then if you've got the economic growth to let it happen, we're going to have to work more, increase labor force participation rates, work, or, and that includes working longer. We're going to have to work smarter, increase productivity. We have huge challenges in Canada of increasing productivity. And from our perspective, we're going to have to continue to get help. We're going to have to continue to have immigration to keep the labor force growing. So no one of these things, this is not a pro-immigration statement. This is simply saying that that is the toolbox that we have to work with. And, to the, and we, no one, all necessary, no one sufficient. From a population forecasting point of view, we have to look at this last one. So moving on. There's net migration to Canada. It's been increasing. It's sort of in steps in the 70s. It was in the range of 100,000. 80s, it went into 150,000. Late 90s and on, it's gone into the 200 to 250,000. Our projections using the data to date say that we're net migration in, to Canada. So ins, immigrants coming in, hockey players, and Celine Dion leaving. Um, which, you know, it's, it's not a bad trade when you think about it. <laughs> I couldn't stay when I was in, uh, in Paris a couple of weeks ago when a friend uh, ran into somebody and said, well, where are you from? You're from Canada. Do you know Celine Dion? <laughs> yeah, you know, we hang, we hang, you know, it's all cool. I skateboard with her kid, you know. Um, so our projection is going to be a little bit of a drop in the level of net migration because this includes temporary workers, this includes uh, non-permanent residents, et cetera, simply because of a cu cumulative thing of the large number of um, work permits issued, then them not being issued, and the people on those permits leaving, and, not, and so you get a little bit of a drop down, and then you swing back up. And so we're seeing it going up to about 250,000 per year. Not seeing it go to 300,000, 350, we're not talking about being swamped, with, we're talking about the next <clears throat> few years looking a lot like the last few years. And if we can achieve that, that helps us with the labor force side of it. We still have the productivity, the working later, all those other things. Um, that will give us population growth in Canada, growing from about 34 million people today up to about 51 million people today, still smaller than France. It's a great book out. 60 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. 
And there's a sequel, I believe, coming out to me. But, but 11 million Greeks, maybe. <laughs> um, so there's the projection. And out of that derives a population growth rate in Canada below its historic 2.1 uh, to 2% per year into this range trending down to 0.5%. And because you are dependent on Canada and immigration to get your younger population, this constrains your population growth. So you're going to see a slowing in population growth as well. So the reference is to take Canada's growth rate and compare it to the projected growth rate for this region. And there's that great gap between the two in the 96 to 11 period, and then this closing of the gap as labor supply tightens up across Canada. So there's our projection. And so that's the discipline of saying, well, we would like to say that Alberta or this region could grow at 2% per year. It can't. But it's going to grow because it does have a strong economy. So that then gives us our Canada projection, our projection for um, migration to the Calgary region. Those may look like straight lines to you, but those are in fact fourth order polynomials, which effectively work out to be straight lines, so I don't know why we bothered, but it is fun, it's fun to do the equations. So they're essentially constant because if we go back in history, they've been essentially constant. So it's reasonable in a trend forecast to use this level. Doesn't catch the swings, but historically the swings have been above that long run average line. Have been about that long run average line. So there's net migration going from 17,000 uh, per year, dropping down to about 10,000 per year as, as the external constraints on labor supply imposed. Let's talk about what we're, going, we're projecting for births. For birth rates, as an evidence-based forecaster, you cannot say anything but that birth rates are going to remain constant because you got 40 years saying they're constant. You know, through all sorts of economic cycles, they're just bouncing around. So, yeah, we could, yeah, I often have people say, but all oh, your forecasts are wrong because women are going to have more kids. It's always a guy that says that. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know. It's, it's, it's people talking about paying kids, paying people to have kids in Quebec, you know, 5,000, whatever it is. And somebody said to me, uh, a young woman said to me, well, now I know how bad having kids is. And I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, they have to pay you to do it. <laughs> so anyhow, there's our projection. You cannot but say that birth rates are going to remain essentially constant. They'll go up, they'll go down, but essentially constant. But that's, we don't forecast total birth rates. We forecast birth rates by age of mother because that we're working with, a, with an age profile population. So we take a look at birth rates, age of mother, and we see that, that 2010, using Alberta so I can get a long data series, 2010, the typical mother was 29 to 30, and there were about 139 kids per thousand women in the age group. Look at what it was at the peak of the baby boom. Typical woman having a child at the peak of the baby boom was 23 years of age, and over one out of four of them had a kid that year, which means all of them over four years would have had a kid, or one lady would have been really, really busy. <laughs> so. A tremendous drop, and so we know this. This is nothing new. Tremendous drop across all age groups, but notice that the big drops in the younger age groups. Let's move forward to a period of time where the birth rate had stabilized at the, the 1.7 level, 1981, and look at the difference. Even in 1981, typical mom, 26, today, 30. All of the, what was lost here gained out here. So it's what we call postponement. So in our, and this is important in forecasting population because every year of postponement is another year before the troops arrive. So it's a replacement problem. So it's like compound interest. It's not just the rate that matters, it's the time period. So this postponing, even by three years, meant a three-year wait for the next round of kids to arrive. Well, we know that postponing is going to continue, but you know what, There's, it's a fixed point out there at the end. And so we're not, never going to talk about the typical mom being a 48-year-old. 
Okay, so one of the things in our forecast when we model this stuff is slowing down postponement. So we still have the postponing going on, but it tends to be just shifting. This becomes, looks more like a wave than a, than a normal distribution. So what we can do then, so we're, we forecast that shifting, but in all honesty, we have, to, we have to damp it out because it's got to stop. And we can see one of the ways that's happening by taking a look at the Calgary region. As an urban region, it's going to be a little bit later than the provincial average. So you can see that Calgary, it's still 30 is the, the, the most typical age, but how it now looks like a wave and it's pushing up here. So that's what we see as, as continuing. So that's another thing that influences our projection. Finally, because it's really important, to me because I just love this chart, is that I'm always kind of puzzled when somebody says, oh my gosh, there's more males being born than females. Something must be, it must be that Epcor water. <laughs> it's history. There are always more males born than females. It's something to do with XY versus XX, I don't know. But in 1921, 51.3% of the births were males, and in 2009, 51.3% of the births were males. So, when, and this, but we, you have to acknowledge this because you are forecasting males and females, and since females are your reproductive population in the future, you have to know how many women are born back here. So we do this, but look, at it, it bounces all over. But take heart that if it, someday you read that it's 52%, and then the next year you read it's 50 and a half, it's just statistical variation. But when you see a pattern like this, you know that there has to be a purpose for there being more males than females. Why do I only hear female laughter? <laughs> well, the reason is that males have a higher mortality rate than females do. And so in this cosmic balancing of things, if you're going to have a greater likelihood of males dying, it would be nice if you had more of them born so that you can at least get some of them to the reproductive stage of the life cycle. And if, by the way, if you ever want to read about how history affects it, I'm rereading the Iliad right now by, uh, by Homer. And ugh, they kill like a thousand people per page and it's a 900 page book and you're kind of going, whoa, what's happening here? Well, what they're doing is they're justifying 51.3% of the births being males. Um, so throughout the life cycle, now this is age-specific mortality rates by age. It's on a log scale. Everybody asks me about my attitude to mortality because I look at death rates every day. I'm in the one in 100 group, and it's 20 years till I'm in the one in 10 group. And my mom's 95, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll go from there. But if I can just make it to the one in 10 group, I'm happy. Um, so there's the issue. So when we're doing our, our, our forecasting here, the, the top end of that pyramid, the size of our older population that we're talking about generating, um, needing health care and pensions for, is influenced by these rates. It's the only thing that influences these rates. It's not migration, it's mortality rate. So we have to, do, to pay attention. It's enormously, enormously depressing for me to talk to you about this on such a fine evening. So we'll go to the happy side and we'll talk about life expectancy. So life expectancy, which is just the mathematical sum of mortality rates. Tremendous growth in life expectancy in Alberta over the last 60 years. Added a little over eight years of life expectancy for a woman over the last uh, 60 years and about nine and a half years for a man over this period. It's tremendous, significant, uh, that's, that is a 10% on, that's like a 15% increase in life expectancy. Very, very significant. One of the things that's causing the world's population to grow is increasing life expectancy. Because the model is we're in this room and the young people are coming in there and I am going to go that way sometime. But I'll wait around for a few years. So what happens to the room? It gets more crowded. So when we talk about what are we going to do about world population growth and people saying, well, we've got to do something about births, well, everything we do to make health better for people increases that. So war, pestilence, disease, and destruction. I mean, that's what, that's it. So there's the thing. Now, given the, the biases I've detected from the female members of the audience, they're looking at this chart and saying, hey, 
Look at female life expectancy beating male life expectancy. Something, you know, innately better about women. Uh -uh. Why is male life expectancy shorter than female life expectancy? <laughs> now, this is, this is starting out, but let's not, you know, it carries on. This is not a thing of youth. <laughs> and then you get into the working stage of life cycle, and you get your first job, and they say, you know, you got to get out there and drill a hole with that electrical drill on the aluminum ladder, and yeah, just put it in the pool. Because, you know, aluminum and water and electricity, they're fine. There's no big problem. You get older, you need help. You don't have a ladder that's long enough, but you have a buddy and a, back, a backhoe. There you go. I told you I grew up in Red Deer. Now, everybody I've showed that slide to said that is so unsafe, having a truck propped up on sticks like that. He's welding next to his gas tank with an arc welder. <laughs> it doesn't matter about the sticks because that truck's going to go straight up. Now, there is, there is a red deer bias in this presentation. You know, gearheads, what we were talking about, racing car, dragging. I used to, I used to race at Shepherd Way, uh, dragsters, uh, Pasadena, etc. So we, it's the gearhead thing. So, but not everybody's like that. The next generation of kids are going to be different. So, yeah, they're going to be different because they won't use equipment, but they're still going to be male. So there's life expectancy, but if you really look closely, well, so one of the things that's done, and from a policy perspective, this becomes really important, it has created a senior's population that is predominantly female. More importantly, it has created in our minds an image of a senior's population that's predominantly female. But if we take a look at the data, since 1975, the gap in life expectancy at birth has been declining significantly. It's gone from seven years to 4.4 years. So that there is increasingly more males per females in the 100 population. The reason this is declining is change in industrial safety, change in the nature of work we do, drunk driving legislation, seat belts, safer cars. And why would you want to go out and drive around in a car in the snow and crash it when you can stay at home and crash computers? So, you know, a, a very significant social change that's going to have its impact in the long run. Our projection is that we will continue to see the gap narrow and we will continue to see life expectancy increase, but it will increase at a slowing rate. And it has to because all of the easy stuff has been done. The big jump in increasing life expectancy is washing our hands. Yeah, no, seriously. Once we do that, that gives us huge gains. With 1921, the leading cause of death for a woman in Alberta. Measles. Communicable diseases. Tuberculosis, all of those kinds of things. So all of those changes, but the thing is, those are easy. Inoculation, public health, that kind of stuff. We're now getting into the realm where there, it's medical technology, and it's much more difficult to get those kinds of gains. So we will get the gains, but they won't be those big gains we've seen in the past. So there's our projection, influences the growth of that older population, but it influences also the character of what our older populations will be in the future. And it means a significant rethinking in terms of social policy and housing and everything, and transportation about how we regard. Marshall McLuhan talked about many people march backwards into the future. And we cannot carry this image from the 50s and 60s and 70s of our grandmas living alone into a future where we're talking about an older population of couples. Now, of course, it gets, uh, this is their third marriage. <laughs> well, it's really interesting. The primary caregivers for seniors in Canada right now are children. But when those children become the second child of the wife's first marriage to her third husband, uh, there's some social fabric issues that have come into play there, which are going to have implications for delivery of social services in communities. But that's another story. Uh, so increasing number of births, even though we've got postponement, because you've got those young migrants, increasing number of deaths, even though we're reducing mortality rates because of a growing older population. So natural increased dropping, so that's another contributor to the slowing that long-run growth rate. 
Net migration, roll it in, there's our, so we're going from about 30,000 to about 15,000 people per year, net, uh, net increase in your population, which is what takes us to here. So that's how I got there. And with geeks, I start at the bottom and work up, but it seemed kind of makes sense to start at the top and then go through it. What happens to the age profile? Well, there's what you look like in 2011. If we do the same animation, see those baby boomers getting older, the second bulge in your population getting older, shifting up, migration and births filling in the bottom and carrying forward out to 2076. I absolutely love that. It's totally useless. <laughs> it's pretty. And if you look at it, you can see, wow, a lot more old people and about uniform increase in the younger population. You really can't do much with it. So let's, but, but it's, it's cool. Um, let's see ooh, something that's useful. Right now in this region, it's 1.4 million. One person. For every one person in this region in 2011, there'll be 2.1 people in 2076. So 112% increase, uh, 2.1 2. for one. So that's your population growth. There's the growth of the 55 to 64. Above average when that um, peak of the baby boom, Katie Lang, Stephen Harper, hit the age group. Another one when that sec, today's 26-year-olds hit that age group. And then because of the, the, those concentrations, it builds a bond to it. So you know that over the next... Um, the whole forecasting period, you're going to have the population of 55 to 64 year olds is going to go faster than average. Don't go out and invest in a company selling bifocals because they're also going to have cataracts. And so what they happen to do when you, I had this this summer, it's cool. They slice open your eyeballs and they suck out the old lens and you can hear it sucking. <laughs> It was great. I did. The, the OR nurse was Cantonese, and I speak some Cantonese, so she and I talked about food while the doctor was <laughs> my eyeballs. And he said, he said after, you're a great patient, you don't blink, nothing like that. I said, but I've never had people discuss food in a foreign language. While I was there. And then they put in plastic lenses, and you can actually tell them where you want to see. And I got the flexi ones. So, and in fact, in about four years, for you younger folk, they're going to have bifocal lenses. So they're absolutely great, but they can't fix extreme astigmatism. So I can now perfectly see two of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so they're perfectly clear and they're about six inches apart, which is just a lot of fun driving in the freeway in Los Angeles. <laughs> Should we turn now? Ah, pick a sign. I'm good. I'm good. So um, there's the growth rate. But given the, your age profile, what you're going to see coming down there, 65 to 74, Katie Lang, Stephen Harper, today's 26-year-old, for every one person 65 to 74 now, it's going to be four in 2076. Now, that's neither a good thing nor a bad thing, but to the extent that there are things that correlate with that growth rate, for example... Somewhere to find your keys. I need like a little implant in the side of my head that I can push to find my keys because by the time I get into the other room, I forgot why I went into the room. I'm happy, <laughs> but I'm kind of standing there. Why am I in the kitchen? Oh, I must be hungry. <laughs> so some issues there. And then 65 to, uh, 75 to 84, and now we are talking about areas of social policy. Very significant growth rates. They're out there. They're in the future. The strength of this is, or the importance of this is, it tells us we have time. When somebody says to me, aging baby boomers are going to collapse the healthcare system, I say, tell that to Stephen Harper and Katie Lang. They're the typical baby boomers. And they are, demographically speaking. So we have to do something about it, but we have time to think about it and to do the right thing. So significant growth there. And then 85 plus, for every one there is in the population today, there will be 10 in 2076. And there will probably be more. Why such a big increase? Well, there's not many of them right now. Because if you go back to when those people were born, 
very, very, very short life except those are the Methuselah. Those are the, the very few who made it through. So it's very few. We're now talking about this group being people who've had all of that care and health during their entire lives. So that's why the, the big increase. So there's the demographic context for this region, and it's way more relevant than the number of people in terms of what you should be doing. From labor supply, health care, transportation, these are the important things, not what the numbers are. The other thing is that all of the younger age groups will go below average, but you guys are lucky because they're going to grow. They ain't growing in the Maritimes. So you've got that delightful challenge of dealing, yes, with growth, but dealing with growth that has a balance to it demographically. So there's a picture. So there's something you can work with in terms of these projections. So, but you know, you really don't care. Because it really doesn't matter from a planning and strategy point of view how many people there are or how many people there are in a particular age group. What really matters to you is what are they going to be doing? And from a land use, planning, transportation, water issue, what are they going to be doing is deeply tied into how they are housed and where they're housed. So really, you have no interest in how many people. I've wasted your time to this point. <laughs> what your interest is, is how are they going to be housed? And it is fundamentally important that when you go home tonight, when you're standing in the kitchen, you say to yourself, the important question is how? Two reasons, can't do much about how many, and how is really the only relevant thing anyhow. So there you go. So I'm going to take now a look at some projections of housing demand. This is what we call living arrangement state, and it tells how people through their, their lives live. So when you're young, you're a kid in, uh, in families living at, in, the fa in family home, you leave and you go out and you live in a couple or perhaps a single parent uh, until you get older and then you go back into being a couple. If you were a single parent, you go up to, into living alone unless the kids never move out. And so this describes generally the life cycle, but you can see that some people double up. In the 20 to 29 age group, there's a significant portion of the people live in non-family households. Those are people bunking together. There's people who rent suites for me and stuff like that. And then it pretty well diminishes into the 5 6% range over the rest of the life cycle. There are other people who prefer to live alone. Now, when I say prefer, they may be looking for the man or woman of their dreams, but they haven't reached the state of ultimate compromise, so they continue to live alone. Uh, and then in the older population, surviving spouses living alone. And then there's an, a growth also in the population living in care facilities and institutions. And, and of course, there, there always has to be some young guys in jail, so they're in there as well. So that really describes what people want to do in their lives. So that when you look at the housing market, people don't say, gee, I can afford a single detached house, so I'm going to get married and have kids. They say, I'm going to get married and have kids, and therefore I will want a single detached house. The driver is what people's wants are. So when we take a look at this, this is the data that tell us how people are fundamentally going to arrange their search for housing. Given that, we can take a look and say, okay, gee, we know how people want to arrange to look for housing. That gives us an indication of how many dwelling units there have to be. So if we take a look at the 30 to 34 age group, 51% of the people in that age group are primarily responsible for the financing of their household. When I was a kid, they used to call them the household head. Then people got confused with bathrooms and they changed it to primary household maintainer. So 51% of the people in this age group maintain the households and 49% live in the households with them. So that's the nature. But what this gives us is a link between people's ages and how many dwelling units they want, but how many dwelling units they want to achieve their goals in housing. So if we take that data, and notice by the way, the 70 to 80, 70 to 84 age group have the highest household maintainer rates. The reason they have it is there's a greater propensity of people in those age groups to live as, as in single person households. So what that does, just looking at it, we know that with an aging population and high maintainer rates out here, the demand for housing will grow faster than the population will grow for at least some period of time. So we take that, we match it with the population um, 
projections we talked about earlier on an age-specific basis. And we can see the demand for housing goes from uh, 555,000 um, dwelling units, occupied dwelling units today, up to about 1.2 million dwelling units in 2076. So we're now talking about a more than doubling of the number of dwelling units in this region. Uh, if we take a look at their growth rates, there's the growth rate in occupied housing. Following that same decay, uh, we saw because the region's population is slowing, but growing more rapidly than the um, population out to 2046, and then the curves close down, and the reason they close down is by 2046, both of those bulges in the population are gone. So they've worked their way through that higher maintainer rate state and the, the, the two uh, variables move back together. So we're talking about adding 694,000 dwelling units to this region over the next 65 years. And there again, if we're talking about a context for discussion, let's not go through all these charts and graphs, work with those numbers. It gives you a pretty good estimation of where you're going of adding about 125% more dwelling units compared to 113% more people. Okay, so there you go, and what I'd like to tell you is you don't care. Because, yeah, that's how many dwelling units there are going to be, but it doesn't really matter how many dwelling units is. What you want to know is what are those dwelling units, and where are they? It's not how many people or how many dwelling units, it's how much services do those units require, and where are they located. So let's go down and take a look at the next level, which is how people express that housing demand on the ground. So single detached housing, see that standard life cycle moving through peak age, maintaining a, uh, a single detached house 40, in the 40% range in, in 45 to 54, and then dropping off as people get older. So that one of the interesting things is the first wave of your population is sitting here and their demand for single detached housing is going to decline, and gee, that might be scary, except a much bigger cohort is sitting right here. So you know from your demography in this chart that there's going to be a pretty significant single detached housing market in this region for the next 75 years, uh, 65 years. Layered on top of that is what we call other ground oriented or attached ground oriented, and that's simply a house with no side yards. Still has a door on the street. In this case, they have garages in the back. Looks exactly like a single detached house, but you got rid of the side yards. Meeting the demand for ground, single detached housing for people that either have a, life cycle, a lifestyle or an economic situation that means they can't afford something with the side yards. So usually we just roll these in, but it's interesting because it gives you a chance to influence decisions because somebody in this cohort, this age group, 50 to 54, may prefer a single detached house, but maybe can get all the benefits in a, in a, a row house or attached ground oriented. So it's A, it's influenceable by policy, but B, it's also influenced by people's behavior because they can make that choice. People back here, I have a friend, well, people back here, um, same thing, I can't afford a single detached house, but actually I can meet all of my needs, including raising my kids in an attached unit. So it gives policy flexibility in terms of meeting the demand for ground-oriented housing, but it gives the ability to cluster it, to do other things with it. And then finally, the demand for apartments, stacked units, the difference between ground-oriented and stacked. Ground-oriented, your door opens onto a yard, and there's nobody living above you, Stacked uh, apartments, there's a unit above you and you enter your door through a shared corridor. Worlds of difference between those two, worlds of difference. So one of the things from a policy, we say it's kind of hard, it's not impossible, it's kind of hard to get somebody to shift from single detached or for somebody to shift from single detached to apartment, but the intermediate provides that planning option. Now having said that, I have a friend who has a, a great kid, a young soccer player, and they live on the 18th floor of the Jameson building in downtown Vancouver. I say, what, 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 where's the kid? How does the kid to play? So you ever heard of Stanley Park? <laughs> so he's found an option that works really well for them, at least for now. So there's your different ho housing formats, but look at who lives in apartments. So you've got an aging population, we've seen that. 
And the highest propensity to live in apartments is in the 75 and older population. So you know, looking forward, there's going to be a lot of opportunity. There'll be a lot of demand for apartments, but there's also going to be a lot of opportunity to attract people who otherwise might be in more land consumptive forms of housing into a more attractive alternative, and perhaps in Phoenix as well. Uh, so there's the picture. So if we, that gives us the basis now to answer that question, what kind of housing and where. But before we do that, we have to do a bit of a digression and acknowledge, first of all, that this represents, yes, what people are seeking, but it also represents how they are constrained by competition for land, by transportation, by affordability. Uh, so this is for us a very important tool because it gives us constrained preferences, the market expression, so we can forecast forward and see how behavior changes over time. And it has changed over time. And what happens in regions is as they grow, as a region's population grows, it becomes more diverse in every sense that you can apply to that word. Come on. It first, at its core, as it grows, the kinds of industry and employment it has change. That you suddenly have personal trainers. We never had personal trainers in Calgary in, um, in 1950. In 1950, if you needed exercise, you took a push mower and you mowed the lawn. You didn't go for a run. You didn't buy running shoes at a running store. You didn't do any of that stuff. And you certainly didn't have come, somebody to come install the high def TV. Okay, so as your economy grows, the industries change, the employment changes, the occupations, the skills that people have change. That in turn means that you have different people. You have a change in people because you have people who have different life experiences and different skills and are looking for different things. You have not only empty nesters, but you have never nesters. There are all sorts of perfectly rational people who never want to go through the experience of watching a child chew with its mouth open. <laughs> Somebody asked me, said, how can you talk to audiences, you know, where people will doze off or wander away? And I said, I've raised children. <laughs> you know, I'm used to people sleeping through my talks and eating and passing out and everything else. So in terms of their preferences, so suddenly you have people, a couple aged 45 to 54, who've never had kids, who've never had a house, but want to have three lavender plants, and they're going to buy perhaps the row housing or the apartment. So a greater diversity, so it gives you more opportunity in urban planning, and it also gives you a demand for a wider range of things. And then you have, in, specifically in terms of housing, people are looking for different things in housing now than they were in 1950 or 60 or 70. But people also have much greater constraints as the region grows, because as the region grows, real land prices go up. When we call it the urban land ratchet, urban, e in, ur urban economics, um, increased competition for land causes prices to be bid up, particularly at places that are accessible. Because what people are willing to do is save transportation dollars, and they take that transportation money and they put it in land to get those places that are more accessible. So what that means is that you get higher land prices. If land is more expensive, relatively speaking, it's called the marginal rate of technical substitution. If land is more expensive, you use it more intensely than if it was cheap. It's amazing to look at how people who live in a single detached house spend their money compared to people with exactly the same income in an apartment building. The people in the single detached house, snowblower, uh, barbecue, all of these house-related things, people in apartments, dining out, nice clothes, et cetera, et cetera. So driven by this relative cost. Because of this more expensive means more intensely or denser, we find that diversity and density accompany growth, and it's something that's happened in, happening in this region will continue to happen as it approaches 3 million. From 2001 to 2006, in almost every age group, the propensity of people to maintain single detached houses declined. And note, it declined, so we're not doing badly, actually. Demand for other, gra that houses without side yards grew in most age groups, except in the oldest age groups where it also declined. So we're already seeing in Calgary that shift beginning to happen. Demand for apartments grew through every age group. Now you say, well, it's because people couldn't afford it. Well, it ain't gonna get any cheaper, relatively speaking, because the region's growing, 
That means the additions go out on the edge. The more accessible sites are the one that's closer in. People are going to bid more for it. Because it's more expensive, they're going to use it more intensely. So there's, a, in the older age group, a significant shift away. Because in the 85 plus thing, you know, snow, I don't know. Snow blowers, eh, no. It's been done. So, um, so there, it's happening in this region, the shift towards more intensive forms of housing. It's happened in other regions. When Vancouver had the same population as Calgary did, 2006 is the data point, 1.3 million people in the Calgary region, 1976 in Vancouver, 1.2 million, had virtually the same single detached, percentage of single detached. Now we come out to Vancouver with 2.2 million, 35%. Sure, Vancouver's constrained by the mountains and the border and all the rest of it. Toronto, on the other hand, when it had 2.8 million, it had only 40%. And nothing constrains the growth of Ontario except sensible people leaving. Um, so, I, 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 the other night I said, except for good taste, and somebody was upset, so I changed that. And made it more explicit. So there you go. As regions grow, this is going to happen. It's an opportunity, it's a challenge, but it's going to happen. So we take it, our, our model, there's what single detached maintainer rates were in this region in um, 2011, and we say that by the time the region hits a 3 million population, propensity to maintain single detached housing will have dropped across all age groups, but particularly in these age groups. Why not in the oldest age groups? Well, because they bought now. Yeah, so now they haven't, no, no, 65 years out. But they're going to get them in the next couple of years, the next five years or 10 years. It's going to be, it's, the squeeze will be back here of the people coming into the market later. Now, just to give you comfort on that, at a population of 3 million, it's still significantly higher than the propensities in Vancouver today. So we're still, we're not talking about a radical change in character. If we take a look at other ground oriented, Pretty well an, an increase across the board in, in, the, in the region projected. Um, no particular pattern, because these are, these are people who are moving at the margin of single to ten. In terms of apartments, uh, single, significant increases. Most of that increase, though, in this stage of the life cycle. Affordability issues, lifestyle issues. Your population at three million, your population's going to be much more a metropolitan population with those kinds of things. Not much of an increase in the apartment, in the older population, because that's pretty well stable now. So there's what we describe behavior in the future, which means you're going to need 270,000 more single detached houses, 169,000 more other ground oriented, and 257,000 more apartments. Biggest growth rate, 220% growth in apartments. Biggest absolute increase, still single detached. Region still preserves its character. If we take a look at that, there's two factors driving that apartment discussion. One is our trending, and the other is the age, aging of the population. So if we, come on, Bruce drop the growth rate of the population, of the housing types on there. Look at that huge gap between other ground oriented and apartments starting in about 2016 and ending in about 2036. That's not driven by our trending, that's driven by the aging of today's, those two bulges in your population today into the 65 plus population. Once they've aged through, it drops down and just follows the other pattern. So there's a projection for housing demand of what you should be planning to, to accommodate in this region in terms of housing. The character of the region is still predominantly ground oriented. It hits 48% of its population, in, uh, of its housing stock in single detached in 2076. To put that in comparison, if we take Calgary at 2.5 million out in 2050, 53% of the, the region's population is living in single detached. 53% of the stock is uh, single detached. At exactly the same population in Vancouver and Toronto, it was 35 and 40%. So still maintaining the character of the region. So now you have a feel for this population, housing demand. You say, wow, this is, whoa, come on. This is great. You don't care. Because I've said single detached, other ground oriented, and apartment. 
But I haven't, we haven't discussed what those look like. And clearly what they look like will have a huge impact, not only on housing, but on land use, on transportation, on infrastructure, on water supply. So this form of single detached has way different implications from that form of single detached, and yet they're both single detached. So you don't care about the numbers. You care about how people do things. Same with an apartment. We've said apartments. Well, this apartment takes way more land than that apartment does. And you say, well, we're never going to live in that. Well, actually, it's in your region now. Um, but the issue is then we'll make it better. It's not about how many units. It's not about how many people. It's not about how many old people. It's how we choose to do things. And that's really important because it gives the control to us. We're not driven by something else. So, oh, I'll skip this. This is fun, but this, this is deep geek. So I've talked about housing. I've talked about population. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Transportation system, road use, transit, air, water. We take a look, your series has been on water. I think water issues aren't the determinant of your decision. Water issues are the consequences of what you decide to do. You should sit down and say, this is the kind of community we want. This is what, how we want to live. And then figure out how to do it in the context of the water you've got. Water doesn't determine anything for you. How you use it determines something. Um, it, um, washing cars and drinking water. People in Vancouver wash the street, not the sidewalk, but the street with drinking water. And you know, do you have a water constraint? Well, you have a water constraint if you want to wash pavement with drinking water. So anyhow, there's the issue. Water, it's like everything else. It's not how many people, it's how it's used. Here's a hotel in Albuquerque. I, I stay in, I live in hotels, okay? And I would say in the last 10 years, I have not been in a hotel that had a bathtub. The Westin did a reno, all showers. This hotel cut its water use by 80%. I mentioned that I was a landlord. On my application to rent, it asked whether you bath or shower. It doesn't matter. You could be a hockey player or into quilting. I want to know whether you bath or shower. Because here's what people who bath do. They go into the bathroom and they turn the tap on a mixture of hot and cold. Put the plug in and then they go off and they make tea. And they get an aroma candle and they phone their mom. That's the guys. Okay. <laughs> and then they come back to the bathroom and they go, oh, look, it's full and... Oh, it's too cold. So they pull the plug out, <laughs> drain it down, and then run some more water to bring it up to temperature. I, this is, do, do not do this at home because the mayor will be unhappy, but I did this in Vancouver where we have a lot of water running down the inside of many of our buildings. Um, a normal shower head, turn it on. It takes 18 minutes to fill it up to the level that a normal person would bath in, and it takes 22 minutes to fill it up to the water, to the drain. Nobody takes a 22-minute shower. If nothing else, you get fatigued 22 minutes. So the issue is, all you have to do is deal with how water is used, and you can change its capacity. So water doesn't constrain you. What you have to do is a vision of what you want your community to be, and then figure out how to do it with the water. The Intel, in Albuquerque, the Intel processing plant, you use gallons and gallons of water to make chips. They have to be cleaned, absolutely pure. So Intel's in Albuquerque, it's a desert, they have no water. They took a look at it and they sat down with their engineers, and the engineer said, well, no matter where we get our water, it has to be 100% pure to use it. So we have to filter it till it's 100% pure. So they said, so let's just not use water from outside. So they have a closed system. They have to filter it anyhow, so they just reuse it over and over again. So external things don't constrain us. They don't stop us. What we want to know is how to do what we're going to do better to achieve the kinds of communities we want. And that will then tell us what we want to do about water, air, transportation, all of those things. 
Um, so there you go. As these clearly show, <laughs> it's how, not how many. Get the t-shirt. Thank you much. Happy trails. And to make you feel really happy. <laughs> it's just so good. Every time I feel lonely or sad. Yeah, that's just, oh. How can you not be happy in a world that has that? It's not sustainable, it's nothing, but it makes me feel good. Can we turn, can we turn the lights up or whatever you want to do? So, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Baxter, fantastic. I think uh, everybody here will certainly uh, have many thoughts. You've given us lots to think about. In particular, one thing that comes to mind is next time somebody significant other says, I think I'm going to watch a little TV, there's all kinds of new implications that we have. For Absolutely. That. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not